Good evening, and uh, thank you for joining us this evening for the launch of Dundurn Press's new imprint, uh, Rare Machines. I'd like to apologize for the delay in getting started, and if you're hearing at least part of this intro twice, uh, we've been having a few technical difficulties, but I think that we've got things sorted out now, and uh, hopefully we'll be good to go because we have a terrific roster of authors for you this evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Beattie. I'll be your host and moderator for this evening's event, and I am delighted to be able to introduce uh, the new imprint from Dundurn Press because I am really excited about what they're doing, and they have put together a sterling debut slate of books. Uh, three memoirs, three novels. Uh, this is an imprint that is explicitly devoted to pushing the envelope in terms of style, in terms of voice, in terms of technique, in terms of approach and subject matter. And uh, as I say, I think that uh, these six books, that uh, all of which I've had a chance to dip into, are uh, excellent examples of innovation, diversity, and uh, some really, really sharp and uh, entertaining storytelling. I am probably not the best person to talk about Rare Machines, um, and I'm going to introduce you to the two people who know a lot more about it and have a lot more to do with it than I do. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, introduce the imprint, then we're going to have a series of short readings from our six authors, followed by a Q&A of reader-submitted questions. So uh, please stick around. It's going to be, a, I think, a really great evening. And uh, wasting no time, I want to introduce you to the two people who are most responsible for making Rare Machines a reality, the acquisitions editors at Dundurn Press, Julie Minnell and Russell Smith, who are here to talk about their vision and how the first lineup of uh, Rare Machines came to be. Please welcome Julie and Russell. Uh, Steve, I'll go first to tell you something a, a little bit about uh, about Rare Machines, where it came from. Dundurn Press has been, in the past, mostly respected for nonfiction, and particularly in the area of Canadian history. It's also published a great deal of young adult fiction, as well as very successful mystery and crime fiction. It wasn't well known for adult literary fiction, so we decided to create a new imprint, imprint to highlight adult literary fiction and unusual memoir, and admittedly to draw attention to the fact that there was a new kind of Dundurn afoot and one that wanted to compete in the realm of literary fiction, a, a prestige intellectual publisher, uh, if you will. So the idea is for Rare Machines to publish literary fiction and poetic nonfiction that's playful, uh, unusual, daring, or innovative. It welcomes hybrid forms, and there's going to be a few hybrid forms you're going to see tonight. Uh, it welcomes emerging writers. It's a place for both the experimental and the polished. And one interesting thing I'd like to stress is that it's also international in scope. So we're doing some translations. Next year we have a book by a well-known Chinese author, who's extremely well-known in China, uh, less known here, Shui Yi Wei. Uh, in translation, we've got a book by a young Quebecois author, that appeared in French last year, Eve Le Mieux. Um, it's called Like Animals. Um, to give you some idea of the moods that we were playing with, uh, the name Rare Machines was Julie's invention and, and she'll tell you about where she came up with the idea. But here are some of the other names for the imprint that we were considered and rejected, okay? Um, Hiraith, Hiraith Press. That is the Welsh word for longing or home. Um, lovely word, but might be difficult for people to remember. Uh, we considered sonar, submarine, undertow, factory. And we, were for a, we came really close to naming the press Dazzle Ships. I think that was the, the, the closest contender in the final. Uh, also Uncanny Valley. You think of Uncanny Valley books. Uh, and also, There Goes My Outfit. That was my personal favorite. I'm a little bit disappointed we couldn't call it There Goes My Outfit. Um, but that list of words gives you an idea of what we were trying to suggest. So something stylish with a hint to the underground or avant-garde. Now, it's not an avant-gardist press, and that would be hard to sell to a large public. And it's not explicitly ideological, although one might argue that there's always something anti-authoritarian about the aesthetically original or the formally innovative. 
So now I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, uh, um, some of the authors you're going to be hearing tonight, not in particular order that you are going to be hearing from them, um, but something about the books. Uh, and, and again, remember, this is our just our first lineup, and then we've got uh, more books appearing in the spring, which I'm going to talk about a little bit as well. Um, we have Sifton and Eper, author of the novel You May. Uh, this is a novel that contrasts two parallel narratives. It's the story of an Afro-Canadian teacher of English living in Japan and her everyday life, frequently facing racism there, and then a fantasy world. It's an underworld or an overworld of demons or supernatural spirits, and they're fighting each other. And then these two narratives end up overlapping. So it's a hybrid literary and fantasy novel. And Sifton was herself an English teacher in Japan, and so this novel is steeped in Japanese culture and language. There it is there. <laughs> Beautiful cover, too. I'm really excited about the covers that we have as well. Um, Sky Gilbert's novel, I, Gloria Graham, just appeared, has a very similar construction. Two parallel narratives, one in the voice of a female movie star of the 1950s, and the other of a contemporary gay male English prof, and they turn out to be the narratives of the same person, where the one is real and one is the fantasy identity. So the protagonist is really in conflict with himself over who he is. The renowned indigenous playwright Thompson Highway called this book a triumph of two-spirited literature, and two, I think two-spirited can be read in several ways here. And the last person who will read tonight, and I really hope you stick around to hear him, is David Witten. David Witten's really hilarious and very intriguing novel, Seven Down. This is the one here that's closest to being a real literary experiment, I think. It's a novel comprised of letters and interview transcripts. The interview transcripts are with a group of employees at a large hotel in downtown Toronto, and they were all sleeper agents for a mysterious international organization, and they were activated to participate in an assassination, and the assassination went badly. The stories, it's not only the story of the attempted assassination, but it's also the story of each of these employees' lives and their hopes and dreams and their reasons for signing up for such a dangerous thing and this not very moral activity. And as you read, you realize that they're not always telling the truth about what happened. Now, next season, we'll be publishing another interesting hybrid novel. I would call it a hybrid by Victoria Hetherington. It's called Autonomy. Autonomy, it's, it's a literary sci-fi novel, a very poetic sci-fi novel, very political sci-fi novel, a feminist sci-fi novel about a woman who develops a, a, a romantic relationship with an artificial intelligence who lives in the cloud, so has no body. And I mention this because uh, of a giveaway that I want to tell everybody about, and that is that you can get this, enter into a draw to receive this book, plus a tote bag. Uh, and all you need to do is present us with a receipt that you have ordered or pre-ordered one of the Rare Machines books and your receipt will be entered into the draw and you might get this book in a tote bag for free. You send that receipt to publicity at dundurn.com. Okay, that's all I have to say. Take us into the readings. <laughs> uh, I mean, take us into Julie. <laughs> take us to the Julie. Take us to the Julie. <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Russell. And thank you very much for the trip down memory lane with all the past titles. Dazzle Ships was indeed a strong contender. And I still think about the Dazzle Ships on a daily basis. Um, <clears throat> so pardon me if I read off a, off a pre-written thing when I go rogue, I tend to get in trouble. So <laughs> um, Rare Machine showcases exceptional new works that are stylistically elevated and unique in their execution. These books challenge pre-existing assumptions of what a novel, a character, a story, or a genre are supposed to be, and break away from the artificial constructs and institutions that have systematized what is considered worthy and literary. Instead, our exciting new titles thwart expectation and resist containment, while seeking to artfully render stories that until now existed outside of the zeitgeist, contributing fresh, original, and invigorating, invigorating material to the panorama of Canadian publishing. Titles like The Shaitan Bride, which blends memoir and horror genres while utilizing feminist theory and Islamic mysticism to tell the cross-cultural coming-of-age story of Samaya Maten, 
whose forced marriage compelled her to reach a deeper understanding of who she is, her faith, and her own romantic desires as separate from the ideals foisted onto her by those around her and the disparate, often contradictory communities she inhabits. Persephone's Children by Rowan McCandless utilizes thematically linked Structural, structurally inventive essays to explore the fraught and fragmented relationships between memory and trauma through her thoroughly imaginative take on the traditional form associated with memoir. She skillfully examines the patterns of history and oppression to bravely convey the multiplicity of paradoxes and intergenerational through lines on her odyssey of escaping the stranglehold of a long-term abusive relationship. Tara McGowan Ross's memoir, Nothing Will Be Different, repurposes the academic lexicon of metaphysics and existentialism to juxtapose the loss of her mother to breast cancer at a young age with her own experience of finding an abnormal lump in her breast at 27. We follow Tara on a journey of intellectual assessment and philosophical inquiry as she navigates the hard partying Montreal art scene and takes inventory of her life choices. In a tale that is equal parts profound and hilarious, nothing will be different is about learning to live while getting ready to die. The title Rare Machines was conceived as an extension of the idea of the book as a cultural artifact, which conveys many meanings, depending on both the context and the reader. They are machines because they serve a function beyond the text. They are rare because their function is ambiguous until they are read. The significance of the book extends far beyond the final passage, page through the consciousness that has committed its words and stories to memory. All of these books we're presenting today are highly original and unlike anything I've ever encountered before in the world of literature. And what I thought about specifically was my own experiences having encountered different books. I thought about finding a book in my grandmother's library my grandmother famously told me, or not famous, famously in my world told me <laughs> that uh, when when I told her I became a I'd become a books editor, she said books are boring. So I don't know how all those books got there because she hates books. But at the same time, they ended up there somehow, and then ended up in my hands, and I ended up reading them, and then they influenced me. I thought about my high school English literature teacher, Mr. Markovich, handing me a copy of The Bell Jar because he had a feeling. His feeling was right and probably not very hard to come by. But what I was actually thinking about was the economy of books as physical objects, that we write them and we put them out into a certain world and maybe we have certain motivations or goals, but those books live on and they encounter many different people throughout, uh, throughout their lifespan. Um, I thought about how in... <laughs> Many years ago, hundreds of years ago, books were much harder to produce. So what would happen is they would print a copy of Chaucer and carry it from town to town so that people could copy it out. And actually at that time, books were more valued for their marginalia because you would write books on top of books on top of books because paper was hard to come by. These books are to me rare machines because they are unique. They are not like anything that I've seen being published today. They have a lifespan and there's something in them that is exceptionally transcendental. And I look forward to seeing these books go forward, onward, over the decades, and all the different people who will pick them out, not knowing what its function is, not knowing what this machine is used for, but being influenced by its words and the profound messages of all of our authors. So thank you so much for all everyone being here. And I guess I'll turn it over to Steve. Thanks very much, <clears throat> Julie, excuse me. That's the theory part of the evening. We're now gonna get into the practice. You've heard about the, uh, the first lineup for Rare Machines. You've heard about the, the reasons behind the creation of the imprint. We're going to jump into some very short readings by the authors who are who comprise the uh, first uh, season of Rare Machines, and we're going to do this in order of publication. So we're going to start with Sumaya Matten, who is a writer, part-time social worker, psychotherapist, and a strategic advisor for the Ontario government who has worked on a wide range of policy files, including anti-racism. 
Sumaya's debut memoir, The Shaitan Bride, is a powerful, nonlinear literary memoir of her experience navigating migration, mental health, and a forced marriage. It's a very powerful story about family, it's about love, it's about Islamophobia, and it's about female desire, which is a subject that is still inexplicably controversial. And I really appreciate this book for being so frank about a controversial subject that should never have been controversial in the first place. Please welcome to the virtual stage, Sumaya Matten. Thanks so much, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me and for joining. I guess I'll briefly describe my memoir in my elevator pitch, just to add on to what Stephen said. So The Shaitan Bride is, a, as Stephen said, a true coming of age literary memoir. It's about my journey from childhood to young adulthood, navigating desire and faith. So my adolescence that I talk about is set against the backdrop of September 11th and all that ensued after it in uh, neo-colonial North America. There are also a lot of references to pre and post-colonial South Asia as well. So at the tail end of my teens, I find myself held against my will in Taka, Bangladesh, facing an unwanted wedding. And so there I have to figure out not only what I will do, but what it means for me existentially in terms of who I am how I will, and how I will approach the life that's ahead of me. So this story wrestles with a lot of enduring questions related to destiny and free will, independence and duty, the battle between human drives and that is that which is more soul inclined, uh, female desire and the question of women's liberation, who gets to define what that is. So that's my pitch. I'm going to do my reading now. All right. So when Bilkis left, I started peeling off each piece of clothing as slowly as I could. As I did, I imagined the vibrancy of the maroon katan sari that would be draped over me, the gold bangles and stacked gold necklaces, my hair with copious amounts of hairspray poofed and uplifted, whitish pink flower garlands inserted. I imagined the white powder applied to my face to make my skin lighter, the deep coal lines bordering my eyes and the blush dabbed on my cheeks. I imagined my wedding hall in Jatia Shangsat Bhavan. I hadn't seen the interior at all, but I had been told that there would be a red carpet leading to a grand stage on which Shoaib and I would sit. Surrounding us would be white drapes falling like the garbs of Nawabs and Maharajas and hanging from them red and white roses to signal unity and new beginnings. Every inch of the hall wall surrounded in fairy lights, covered in fairy lights. The tables for the over 500 guests, or maybe a thousand, draped in tablecloths made of silk. To the side, by the stage, would be a grand glass table with a colossal lamb roast. This is where the close family members of the bride and groom would sit. The roast would be served with plain white Palau, peas, onions, green chilies sprinkled on top, as well as borhani, the yogurt drink blended with mint leaves. I imagined also faces that I did not know, dressed in their best, greeting me with curiosity and offering blessings. Laughter, chatter, music playing, a chaotic cacophony of scents and sounds devoid of meaning for me then, all fleeting. We were to skip all the other cultural wedding rituals, and perhaps many of the guests would be confused as to why. The Banchini, Mendi, Gaiholu, the Haldi, and even the Bopat or Walima, if necessary. It was important for Boromama that the focus be on the Nikah. I myself didn't understand why under such a circumstance guests needed to be involved at all, or there even needed to be decorations. Because, Nani said, you only get married once. You are the second eldest daughter and her most prized. We wouldn't take this opportunity away from you. I would have appreciated this if this was a wedding of my choice, but it wasn't. I would be showered with fineries that millions of women all over the world only dream of. Yet right there and then, it was not something I wanted or even felt worthy of. In that moment, I'd consider anything more appealing than waiting to be disrobed in a five-star suite after all the guests had left. I wondered how it was that love and seclusion, although sinful, felt somehow more convivial than this consummation that everyone would be aware of. I wanted the legitimacy of a socially recognized union with the one true love, 
but not like this, not at all. After all the merrymaking was done, after all the merrymakers were gone, after the ladies Gopi Foundation melted off their sweat and the young women exchanged phone numbers with young men to whom they'd never apply, after some uncles shared a smoke and after the low-wage servers and cleaners took home their pay to feed their hungry families, I would just sit be left I would just be left there with a marriage contract I had not wanted to sign. I didn't understand then the logic of it all. Nanya wanted to say, I don't love this man. That love and running away for it, giving my life for it, was more appealing than feeling like a queen of Nawab and receiving all these gifts, dressing up and looking beautiful, being catered to hand and foot. None of it mattered when my heart out, my heart called out only for him and what was right. If the situation was in force and it was simple, a simple arranged marriage, yes, I could have considered it. There was such, there was very much a difference, although most people outside of the culture didn't necessarily realize it. Arranged marriages aren't necessarily forced marriages. Most marriages are at the very least encouraged by external forces, but a forced arranged marriage is tantamount to legalized rape. Whether rich or poor, it didn't matter on which strata one found themselves in. This type of rape could be condoned, although it was not permitted in the religion. In the Quran, it says, you who have believed, it is not lawful for you to inherit women by compulsion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sumaya. Our next author is uh, Sifton Tracy Anapar, who has a deep love of Japan where she lived and worked for four years and which became the inspiration for her debut literary fantasy novel, Yume. When Sifton is not in the classroom or writing, you can find her collecting the stickers and stamps that are essential to her process, re-watching her favorite movies, or playing video games. Yume is a uh, an epic book. You usually don't hear the word epic applied to books by women authors, but this really is. Uh, it's a book about language. It's a book about monsters. It's got aspects of genre horror in it. It's also a very empathetic look at cr cultures crossing and the way people negotiate different backgrounds and different experiences. So to read from Yume, please welcome to the virtual stage, Sifton Tracy Anapar. All right, am I, I think I'm unmuted. All right. Hi, hi everyone. Um, thank you, thank you for that intro. Um, and yeah, I am the uh, kind of the, I guess the the brainchild um, behind Yume. Um, I feel like you kind of covered everything. <laughs> um, so I'll give my kind of pre-scripted um, elevator pitch. Uh, so Yume is, yes, a story about uh, a young woman who is teaching English in Japan. Um, and I guess as you read her story, you're going to kind of follow her um, slow kind of downward spiral into this um, kind of Wonderlandian tunnel of culture shock. Um, I guess I kind of I wrote it as an urban fantasy. Um, but yeah, it is. Um, it's got lots of demons. It's got lots of um, theory about dreams and kind of, you know, where we where we go and what we do uh, when we do fall asleep. And um, yeah, it's got lots of um, Japanese mythology and cultural references. Um, so anyone who is teaching there now or has taught there before, there's you know lots of little Easter eggs in there for you. And um, yeah, it's kind of got mo moments of um, you know humor, but also kind of dark dystopia. Um, and hopefully by the end, you get a bit of sense of um, some hope as well. So um, you know, it's. Uh, it's got a lot. It's got a lot. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read uh, a little bit from, I think this is part one. Um, and hopefully everyone has had dinner. Uh, if not, um, and I make you hungry, I apologize in advance. Okay. Uh, the yokai follows the maitre d' into the restaurant, barely acknowledging the restaurant's greeting, for she is distracted by two long buffet tables in the pit, groaning under the weight of a hundred dishes. Upon the stage, three massive iridescent squids with white hachimaki headbands fast bang, bang fast steady drums on a dozen taiko, sorry, steady rhythms on a dozen taiko drums. The yokai takes it all in, the creatures, the waitresses' kimonos, the food, the mayhem. At the peak of oni-oni hours, 
Jibun Jishin is in high-spirited chaos. The maitre d' walks up to the table on the left, past a group of women in business suits eating pink sashimi slices and feeding gadi to the lips hidden in the back of their heads. Beside them, seal-like yokai toast turban shell sashimi with their flippers, while tiny creatures crawl all over their bodies, licking salt off their fine hairs with tiny pink tongues. Across the table, red-eyed, leopard-spotted monkeys nibble roasted spiders and smoking cedar chips. The maitre d' stops between a large rooster sitting before a heap of flaming bamboo shoots and a one-legged yokai holding a freshly sucked crab shell. A stool pulls itself out for the yokai as dishes form before her. Steamy gyoza, sizzling lemon ginger fried chicken, golden yellow corn drowned in, in butter and soy sauce, warm crunchy pumpkin sushi, roll, sushi rolls, glistening lotus root chips, a giant bowl of nikujaga, matcha ice cream dusted with dark green powder sublimating a frosty incense-like smoke, freshly baked taiyaki, bubbling lava cheese tarts, and colossal stacks of alternating hamburger patties and sourdough buns layered with lettuce and tomato sauce and dripping mayonnaise and ketchup. The maitre d' smiles. As you can see, we strive, to, we strive to provide our guests with their innermost desires, whatever they may be. Now, which one would you like? The yokai takes a deep breath. All of it. The end. Thanks, Sifton. I have not had dinner, and uh, I think my local <laughs> Japanese place is closed, so uh, I'm sorry. that's unfortunate. <laughs> Sky Gilbert is a writer, director, professor, and drag queen extraordinaire with numerous awards under his belt for his plays, previous novels, and poetry collections. He was the co-founder, artistic director of Buddies and Bad Times Theater, North America's largest gay and lesbian theater, and his most recent novel, I, Gloria Graham, brings the drama of a notorious film star to life as an imagined alter ego for his main character. I, Gloria Graham is shorter than you may, but it is no less powerful. It's a story about aging. It's a story about 1950s Hollywood. It's a story about the ingenue Gloria Graham and her one-time husband, Nicholas Ray, the director of Rebel Without a Cause, among other films. It's also satirical and controversial in the best possible way. To read from I, Gloria Graham, please welcome the great Sky Gilbert. Wow, thank you very much. Um, it's a bit much. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to say that this book uh, is about the imagination. Um, and it's, a, it's to some degree about appropriation. And it's to some degree about the right to write. Um, so Thompson Highway, who, uh, as Russell mentioned, uh, wrote a little bit of a, a recommendation, the back of the book. Um, I asked him once about appropriation, about um, uh, a white uh, CBC guy who wrote a, 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 a movie about residential schools. I said, what do you think about that? And he said, well, anybody has the right to write what they want to, but they might get it wrong. So um, that is the principle that this book is based on to some degree. It's a, a gay man who has a woman inside of him and wants to write about it. Um, yeah, and so he he has the right, but he might get it wrong. <laughs> Do gay men have women inside of them? Good question. Um, I would say that all people are somewhat androgynous. Um, we are we we are culturally made into women because of the sexual acts that we do that a lot of people can never get out of their minds. Um, I won't talk about those acts, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Then there are effeminate gay men like me like me, who love their mothers too much and dress in drag, I am one of those. Um, but also, I just wanted to write about Gloria Graham, the most scandalous actress in Hollywood history. You don't know the real story. You may know a little about her. Okay, so I'm gonna read a passage in the novel where um, Denton Moulton, who is the university professor, the gay, old, kind of crumbling university professor who's the central, uh, kind of the central character, but then he also lives through writing about and writing as Gloria Graham. But this is Denton explaining his relationship to Gloria. I started writing as Gloria after a tiny child started hitting me in the back, in the leg at the bank. 
It didn't so much hurt as it was annoying, but I decided I, I wouldn't put up with it. So I leaned down to his general area near the floor and said, please do not hit me, sir. Oh, when I stood back up again, his mother was staring at me furious. Would you mind not talking to my son? Please keep away from my family. She used the word family, a kind of trigger for those like me who are perceived to be uh, so grotesque or at least odd, so odd as to not deserve a loving family. I stiffened, which doesn't look good on me, I'm sure. But he was hitting me, I said. Please don't talk to my son, she said, turning him away from me as the child was inevitably fascinated by the spectacle. And then she continued, don't talk to that man. Don't talk to him. He's a bad man. Very bad. You might get something. I shrank inside. All of me shrank, not just what you might imagine shrinking. That's usually pretty shrunken. Anyway, frankly, I wanted to die. I knew, of course, what she was referring to, AIDS. Well, I went home immediately and wrote. I wrote like a fury and invented Gloria. You've probably never heard of Gloria Graham, and you probably think you've never seen her in a movie, but you have. She played Violet Bick in It's a Wonderful Life. Remember? The town whore, well, that's a bit of an overstatement. She was the as close to a whore as Hollywood could come in that wholesome movie. She was the sad and lonely loose girl in town who flirts shamelessly with James Stewart. And then she played the girl who can't say no in the movie version of Oklahoma. That's what Gloria Graham always played. She was born to play it, the bad girl. But more than that, the girl who couldn't help being bad. And on top of that, the girl who had a heart of gold. She was the epitome of femme fatale. And she was not perfectly beautiful, which she was very aware of, but instead just incredibly sexy. The most important thing about Gloria Graham was that she could actually act. She came from an artistic family. Her mother was an acting teacher and her father was a writer. She knew what she was doing and no matter how witless or promiscuous the girl she had been required to play, you just knew that she was centered, grounded, real, and owned her passion. Well, the fantasy is that someday I will become her, that I will leave this body, this sad, little, the sad little effeminate man will disappear and all that will be left will be the proud, lustful woman of my dreams. Thanks so much, Sky. Our next reader is Rowan McCandless, an award-winning author of fiction and creative nonfiction who seeks to give voice to the experience of people living at the margins. A tangential thinker, Innovative form, a ten, excuse me, a tangential thinker, innovative forms fit the way she catalogs and understands the world, which are reflected in her stunning memoir, Persephone's Children, which chronicles her odyssey as a black biracial woman after escaping the stranglehold of domestic abuse. This is, as you might gather from the subject matter, not always an easy book to read, but it is a very frank and forthright book. It probably uh, fits the rare machine's mandate to a T because it's fragmented, it's a mosaic, it's non-linear, but it is undergirded by a pervasive intelligence, a frankness, a uh, knowledge of literary history, and a very uh, welcome confessional aspect. Please welcome Rowan McCandless. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for that introduction, Stephen. Um, I'm going to start off with my uh, elevator pitch. And um, yeah, so here it is. After years of secrecy and silence, I leave the stranglehold of a long-term abusive relationship and rediscover my voice, identity, and sense of community through, write through writing. An account of trauma and survival, Persephone's Children pushes the boundaries of memoir by making use of experimental forms, such as a legal contract, an archaeological field study, and a speech and language clinician's report as examples. As a Black biracial woman, I also seek to understand the role that intergenerational trauma has played out in my life. And that's Persephone's children. I'm going to be reading from the chapter entitled A Map of the World, in which I made use of ge geographical terms to tell the story of domestic abuse. Compass. I know we're polar opposites, but I couldn't help but love you. I grew compass roses in my cottage garden just so they bloomed in your direction. We followed a trail of scarlet rose petals as if we were navigating our way through a fairy tale wood. I wonder, was it ever really possible for us to find our way out of the forest, you know, 
the one we couldn't see for the trees. You were a Boy Scout once upon a time, but I don't think it helped. And me, I had really bad astigmatism and a lousy sense of direction. Still, didn't you love how our bodies bumped and collided as we walked down the perennial aisles of the garden center on our way to say I do? Polaris, the Big Dipper, the Drinking Gourd, how many lost their ways following that North Star to freedom? We huddled on the beach beneath a cemetery of dead sons. You pointed the way towards Polaris, true north, true love. You told me we'd grow old together, that when the time came, your spirit would wait for me on the North Star. You said, our souls are bound for all eternity. We'll be together always. Cartography. You and I lie in bed in your apartment beneath a blue half moon sculpted from fiberglass attached to the wall. Your hands, your tongue, are expedition parties mapping desires and betrayals along the contours of my body, some body. We play Marco Polo with my past as I float on the ceiling and watch you fuck me. In group, we survivors yield to the past, exhausted by detours. There's no more lying to ourselves, keeping secrets. We map our emotions with brand new packs of crayons, smelling of innocence. We create internal havens hidden from the rest of the world. We summon safe spaces, real or imagined, to calm neural pathways of guilt and shame, arterial thoroughfares of terror. Bearings. Using two po or more points as a reference to determine an object's position or direction. My domestic abuse counselor, Donna, says the decision to leave the situation is scary. It's a journey into the unknown, a trust walk. She says it's like standing in front of a long, dark tunnel carved through a mountain. There's a glimmer of light at the opposite end. And even though it's frightening, the only way through is forward. Break it down, step by step. No one should have to do this alone. It was you and me, babe. It was us against the world until it wasn't. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rowan. Our fifth reader is Tara McGowan Ross, an urban Micmac multidisciplinary artist, theater critic, and poet who is very cool and attractive and has fun all the time. I'm not making that up. It says right here, she has fun all the time. Her debut work of nonfiction, Nothing Will Be Different, is an unflinchingly honest and extremely relatable memoir that reflects upon the post-millennial gig economy's impact on the physical and mental health of young people who are simultaneously learning how to own their identities in the present cultural world. And what that doesn't tell you is that it is also in places absolutely eye-wateringly funny. To read from Nothing Will Be Different, please welcome Tara McGowan-Ross. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, this book basically begins um, with the discovery of an abnormal breast lump, which leads to my being completely and utterly convinced that I absolutely have cancer and I'm dying immediately right now. Um, so, uh, which isn't actually quite as insane as it sounds because it's like, while cancer at 27 is really not like not a thing that happens very often, it ha it's more likely if you have a family history of it, which I do, and my mother died of it, and so did my aunt, and I only had, you know, my grandmother had three daughters, two of them got cancer before they turned 50. It was like a whole big thing. And then also um, it's even more likely if you, you know, have a poor diet, um, smoke, do drugs or drink, which were all occupational hazards in the like Montreal art scene. So um, it didn't look good for me. Uh, so basically I decided that um, I want to, I wanted to like set the record straight and, you know, write the, the story of my life um, in my own words. So um, I, just I, so I, I decided to start with my first great humiliation, which was getting dumped when I was 19 for reasons that I will not, I completely refuse to examine um, and just basically move forward to the present. So um, this uh, section that I'm reading from is, uh, I'm still in Halifax basically before I ran away because I was too embarrassed to live there anymore. Um, so this is how it goes. <clears throat> I waited a whole three dates to sleep with him, which was the picture of prudence and chastity for 19 year old me. I meant to wait longer, but our third date was to an open mic and Tim was there. I hadn't seen Tim or spoken to him since that night he had a panic attack. 
I was extremely frustrated and pissed off to see that he looked good, even more so when I saw that he also had a girl with him. With Sandy next to him, I tried my best not to stare at Tim and this mystery girl. They were just sitting together across the room and Tim had lots of friends who were girls, so maybe it was nothing. I drank my drinks too fast and tried to give my date the attention he deserved. Tim was obsessed with me, I thought. There's no way he's moved on this fast or at all. If I'm not over it, he sure as shit is not. But then I looked up and stole another glance over and I saw that Tim had his arm around this girl's shoulders. I saw, I saw him whisper into the ear of this girl who was pixie small and laughing and blonde and worst of all, thin. And I knew that they were together and it was the real deal. And I knew I had to do something drastic. I want to play. I slurred to Sandy, now very drunk, and I made a stumbling exit from the booth where we were sitting. I staggered to the bar, took several more shots, and then went to the stage. I don't exactly remember how signups worked or how quickly I got on there, but let's just say that I got on right away. I know I took a borrowed acoustic and strummed up a song I'd been working on since my earliest, most desperately horny years, when I came into slippery, fretful pubescence amongst the cow patties and hay bales and tween farmhands of rural Ontario an angry, screamy acoustic cover of uh, Train in Vain, Stand By Me by The Clash. It was the final act in the distinguished drama of Tim and Tara. I raged in Joe Strummer's voice about my job and my apartment and the other poverty-stricken humiliations of youth, all of which would be rendered fair if only Tim would bless me with his love. It was a completely genuine swan song, my bitter reputation for a cruel you who would not stand by me, whose love I still felt like I deserved still felt was my rightful property, still felt was the only fair consolation for a childhood spent begging a God who never answered and an adolescent spent twitching and swollen with the kind of want that only grows where needs are never met. In the shadow, Sandy was standing, unbuttoning his blazer, trying to look natural while making sure he was at the perfect angle for me to get a good look at the shirt under his jacket, which was faded and vintage, but where I could see the clash still written across the front, 30 odd years after it was printed. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. Our uh, final reader for the evening is David Witten, who has, uh, along with Rowan, kind of written the quintessential Rare Machines book. This is, if William Burroughs and John le Carré had ever collaborated, you might get something resembling Seven Down. It's, it's that kind of a weird spy thriller. David Witten is the author of a story collection, as well as short fiction that has appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including Best Canadian Stories and the Journey Prize Stories. His debut novel, Seven Down, which has been praised as wildly original, profound, and very now, is a brilliant, puzzling, epistolary novel where he showcases his gift for different voices in first-person narratives as the story of a failed assassination attempt unfolds in interview transcripts. To read from Seven Down, please welcome to the virtual stage, David Witten. Hello. Okay, um, here's the pitch. Uh, Seven Down is the story of Operation Fear and Trembling, an assass assassination attempt that goes terribly wrong. A shadowy organization has planted sleeper agents at a luxury Toronto hotel. For years, these sleepers have been biding their time, going about their lives, just ordinary employees at the hotel. None is aware of the other's existence, Upon activation, each sleeper is given one simple task to accomplish. The seven agents act in synchrony, unwitting participants in this sinister act. The story is told in a series of interviews conducted after the fact. As the sleepers recount their roles in the event, they digress and reminisce, they uh, bargain with their interviewers, and they struggle to make sense of their new reality. Okay. So this uh, excerpt is uh, uh, from the point of view of a maintenance guy who has been given the task of disassembling a chandelier so that it falls to the ground to, cr to create a distraction. So here he is on, up on the ladder by the chandelier. It felt terrific to be up there. I can't even explain above all those human heads like a young god. They had no idea what was to come. I would unleash hell upon them, screw their little convention, their anthropoid vanities and trifles and curiosa. I loosened the nuts on the two supporting bolts and was about to tackle the master, after which all that electric crystal would go slamming to the floor when an old 
a very old, a frail old man, a white haired bone rack in a yacht club blazer and ill fitting slacks pushed his wheelchair bound wife directly under the chandelier. I'm not even kidding. I was fucking dumbfounded. Why would he do such a thing? I want to be charitable. He seemed only half aware of his surroundings and confounded generally by the state of the world. But for fuck's sake, I stopped what I was doing and waited. I gazed around 360 at all the puny humans down there, tried to recapture that godlike sensation I'd had only moments before. But then I peered down again at that frail little head directly below me, her little perm. She had a bald spot on her crown, a wad of Kleenex in her fist. And goddamn, the air just left my balloon. I waited some more. Where the fuck was he? I couldn't see him anymore. I looked at my watch. This distraction needed to happen at 2.45 exactly. It was now 2.42 and 49 seconds. I had just over two minutes to decide whether to kill this woman or let the operation fail. I waited, I waited, and he didn't come back. And if he was anything like my dad, he was probably still trying to avoid his bladder in the men's room. Then with 20 seconds remaining, it came to me, that old chestnut, perfect is the enemy of good. What the company needed was a big generic distraction, not specifically a chandelier smashing to the ground. And so I calmed down, counted 10, nine, eight, and hoped for the best. I grabbed the top bars of the chandelier and holding my breath, kicked the ladder out from under me. It clattered onto the marble floor and echoed through the lobby and a murmuring crowd gathered round as I thrashed and twisted in the ether. I marveled at my predicament. What untreated pathology had led me here to this idiotic midair spectacle? I swung across a constellation of upturned faces, brown and black and white, their arms outstretched as if to cradle me as I fell, and fall I did when I saw the old lady was out of danger. I waited one second, two, then let go of the light fixture and dropped through all those well-meaning cradling arms, landing on the tiles with a wet, corpse-like smack. Thank you, David. And thank you to all of the authors who read tonight. Those were absolutely outstanding readings and they're absolutely outstanding books. I would encourage you to go to your local bookstore, get online, order each and every one of them because I promise you, you won't be disappointed. We're going to move on now to the Q&A portion of the evening. And these are reader submitted questions. There are two for each author and I'm not sure how we're doing in terms of time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the first set. And then if we have enough time, we can circle back and, and do the second. Uh, and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna do the same order that we did with the reading. So we're gonna start with Sumaya. Uh, and the question for you, Sumaya, is in your memoir, you mentioned that this is not a rescue story. Can you elaborate on this? What kind of myths about Muslim Canadian women do you hope this book will address? Sure, thanks, Stephen. So uh, Julie and I always call this, we've called this uh, memoir an artifact. And so when I think about this book and just like you know, a person finding this book um, and, and reading it, um, that the disclaimer that I've added there, this is not a rescue story for me personally, is a statement to that reader, that interpreter, the person who's going to explore what's within this artifact, that this story for me is, is not about me being saved, uh, at least not in the conventional ways that uh, the person would, would think about it. And so just to give a little bit more um, context to that. So in the story, you know, I, I, I refer to my, um, I, I talk about my adolescence and that happens in the backdrop of, you know, 9-11 and the war on terror uh, or the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. And at that time, there was this discourse that started sort of um, getting like larger and larger about uh, Muslims, especially Muslim women. And it really centered around veiling and um, them lacking the rights that women in the West have. And there was this sort of narrative about, you know, like for them to um, become free, they need to be more liberated. And so this question of liberation and like, what does liberation mean? And what are they being saved from? And, um, you know, if, if we dig a little bit deeper, 
this, when we think about, and one of my favorite scholars speaks to this, her name is Alila Abulogod, and I always look at her, her work on this, you know, she speaks about like this moral crusade that started happening at that time, where it was almost like in any kind of invasion or any kind of war, there's like this dichotomy that's set up where the other is perceived as like barbaric or as having something um, that like a generalization about them that sort of justifies an invasion or justifies like a sense of control. And that kind of takes away from the self-determination of that community itself, from like, you know, their particular meanings and associations and their sense of empowerment. And so for me, putting that disclaimer is an automatic sort of boundary that I've set saying, hey, I'm letting you into my world. You're going to, you know, hear about, you're going to read about this topic, like this very contentious topic of, or misunderstood topic of forced marriages, which is generally associated with, um, you know, like South Asian culture, Muslim culture, Muslim women, because of these prevalent stereotypes or these narratives that were so dominant in the media. And so I'm letting you in. I happen to be Muslim. I happen to be South Asian. I happen to be, you know, in Bangladesh when this happens. But like, I want you to know that this is not about you coming in with those ideas. And it's not about this dichotomy of be me being liberated in a certain way. Um, it's actually my personal liberation has nothing to do with that. In fact, it is more about um, it's, it's personally, as when you read the memoir, you'll see it, it becomes about, uh, basically a spiritual liberation in which I contend with the dark aspects of humanity, um, within my context, within my family, within the community, but also in neo-colonial North America, where there's a lot of racism and it's at the bedrock of societies. So, and it's about also the dark aspects of within my own self, mm -hmm. psychologically, and the different conflicting drives that I have. So, you know, like in an Islamic uh, sort of psychology perspective, there's like your human drives, there's like your uh, soul drives, there's like the different cognitions, things you think about, your emotions. And in my story, you kind of see there's a conflict in all of these things. And that speaks to some the bicultural experience as well, being a part of different worlds and thinking about things and having different experiences and how do I make sense of all that? So, so it's that me going through that process within that darkness uh, time and trying to make sense of what is happening to me and coming out of that in a way where I can still feel like I've acted out of my own agency, but also uh, I still have some sort of faith in humanity within my family and also uh, my general faith. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I think that in itself, that uh, last part, I just want to also emphasize that that also speaks to this pre preconception that the Western Muslim woman isn't doesn't have faith or the Western Muslim woman is not Muslim enough. So I, I want to contest like I want to um, sort of uh, question that as well, because, uh, you know, it it doesn't it's not uh, there's it faith is complicated and uh, our personal associations with faith is complicated. So, so I think, uh, and it's very personal too. So it's just trying to break the dichotomies and that, that broader narrative, um, about Muslim women in general, but also, uh, you know, what, like Muslim women in the West, Muslim women that are not in North America, um, and, and, um, and kind of saying that, stating that this is, you may, you, this book may mean different things to you, but for me personally, um, this is not, I, I am not needing to be saved. And there's a, a lot of diversity in, in Muslim experiences. And it's that statement right there to, to kind of put that boundary, boundary there right from the beginning. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sumaya. Sifton, um, this question has to do with food. And I'm going to remind you before you answer this, I have not had dinner yet. So there's nothing I can do about it. I'm we so talk so much about how beautiful the cover of your book is, and it is gorgeous. But we would love to know more about the food. Can you tell us about the theme of consumption in the novel and how you feel the cover reflects this? Sure. Um, I'm not muted, right? OK. Um, yeah. Um, so it's actually it's actually really interesting because, um, yes, the cover, the cover is amazing. Um, Sophie did a phenomenal job on the cover. 
And um, it's kind of interesting because I wasn't sure if she had read the whole story, but um, if you kind of like, I'm still kind of playing Where's Waldo with this cover. Um, but when you read, when you finish reading the whole thing, you can actually kind of see all the kind of Easter eggs and the honorable mentions that are, um, that are featured in Yume and they all, how they all kind of appear on the cover. Um, so thank you, Sophie, if you're watching, you did a fantastic job and I love this cover so much. It's, ah, oh, it's amazing. So, um, but yeah, the theme of consumption. Um, so it's, it's actually kind of interesting how it came about because, um, mm -hmm. I don't want to give too much of the story away, but I felt like while I was writing Yume, it was more about, um, I guess, kind of satisfying how multiple characters kind of, how they find ways to satisfy that basic need for, for food. Um, so there were a lot of themes of not only just, you know, of, having to eat and never really being satisfied, but also you have a lot of, you know, kind of um, relationships that are kind of like, you know, the predator and prey. So there's, you know, the person who is eating and then there's the, you know, the person or the thing that, you know, is, has this fear of being eaten. Um, and I find that also translated into the cover as well, because um, again, when you kind of take a look at it, you'll see that, a lot of eyes and teeth are featured. So I thought that really kind of captured that sense of, you know, always being watched and always being, you know, having that fear of being preyed upon. Um, and that really also, yeah, kind of really shines through with um, with the cover, which will, you know, hopefully make sense by the time you get to the, the end of the story, which I'm not going to give away. But yeah. Yeah, it's a dope cover. I love it. Thank you, Sophie, if you're watching. Thanks so much, Sift and Sky has just stepped away for a moment, so we're going to uh, skip down to Rowan for this next question. Your memoir is a non-traditional, non-linear book of non-fiction. Why was it important for you to tell your story this way, and how do you think the form influenced the way you told the story? Um, thanks for that, Stephen. It was important for me to tell my story in this way, so as to mirror the fragmentation and non-linear remembrances of trauma. Also for me to share openly about domestic abuse and intergenerational suffering, I needed to make use of the lyric essay forms in order to dig deep and write about vulnerable material. The structures that I used were integral to the storytelling. And for this particular book, there wasn't any other way I could have written Persephone's children in order to mirror the experiences of having gone through leaving domestic abuse and then having writing become my lifeline. Thank you for that, Rowan. Sky, are we good? <laughs> my computer almost lost uh, power, but <laughs> I managed to move and now I'm trying to get the picture of the, the naked man doll out of the frame. <laughs> okay, so what's up? Are you ready? Yeah. Uh, this is a question that uh, was submitted by a reader, but uh, it's one that I'm fascinated to hear your answer to, so I'm gonna ask it. Your novel is satirical. Do you think that writing satire is a political act? I don't really know if I would call my novel satirical. Um, I would call it funny. Um, and um, I do think that most humor comes from anger and I have a lot of anger. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, I think that very much so um, that, um, that it comes from, and it comes from a very serious place. I mean, <sighs> I just had dinner just trying to get the right shot, but I might as well give up. Um, I just had dinner with a, a, a famous clown let's put it that way and i was astounded i don't want to tell you the person's name i was astounded at how you know it, very tragic this person was right um and um anyway so i do think that when you get to the heart of all of us people and i'm a bit of a clown i really am like a lot of my work is and certainly when i perform that's my specialty is making people laugh so um 
I think that um, that comes from a very dark place and a very angry place. That's the best I can do because it, it isn't really meant, it, it, I think at its fundamental core, it's a very uh, serious novel. Anyway, but it is kind of funny. So that's what I would say. Thanks for that, Sky. Uh, moving on to Tara. When we talk about your book, we often reference the phrase learning to live before getting ready to die. What does this mean to you? How do you think folks growing up in the economy, culture, et cetera, that we are in can do the same? Mm, great question. Um, I think that um, the phrase to me, um, it sort of speaks to um, how, okay, so I was having this conversation with my partner recently about how intelligence isn't really real. There is like, like, like intelligence is fake, there's competencies, right? And there are some very broadly applicable competencies and some very narrowly applicable competencies. So like, so like if you like, and what I, what I like about the step back that I studied philosophy is that it's, it, it, it taught me a lot of very broadly applicable competencies, but like, I can't change a tire on a car. So like, or like do anything about a, in a car. I'm really stupid. Like I'm a total idiot. I don't know anything about a car at all. So like, um, so what, and what, one of the, one of the like broadly applicable competencies that I like about my philosophy degree is that it, it, it like forced me to think a lot about death and like, and mortality and stuff like that. So, um, and, and about like how I want to live my life in relation to the fact that I'm going to die at some point. And especially it, like, it like forced me to be like, I literally had to sit in a room for like four years and think about like, like, you know, like, what if, what if like, you know, there's an afterlife, what if there isn't like, you know, like what, like it, like, especially like if we're, if like, if this is all there is on earth right now, like how can I live my life so that I'm not holding out for a future that might not exist? Like I think that was like specifically the like main thing I was grappling with is this idea of just like, I think the, the biggest um, tragedy of capitalism a lot of the time is that people are constantly striving towards this future that is not not promised at all like you know like like striving towards like if i if we keep on if, if we just keep working really hard eventually we're going to get to this like this these 5 10 15 20 years at the end of our lives where we're actually going to get to relax and enjoy ourselves but it's like not only is that not promised it's like tomorrow isn't promised or even really real it's just like a series of nows that happen in a row so it's like how can i like how can i construct my life so that i like so that it doesn't feel like a big waste when it inevitably when I get hit by a truck or like get cancer or whatever. Um, so like I think that that's the main question I was really like thinking about um, and like and uh, that I continue to think about and uh, that like that I that especially I think about a lot when it comes to like jobs. You know, <laughs> like is this how I want to spend my potential potentially last day on Earth? You know, like if the answer is no, there are other you know, ways to spend your day. Uh, up there are there are other crappy jobs. Is what I keep on telling people over and over again. There's no reason to ruin your life at this one. Anyway, so that's uh that that's my whole thought. Thanks for that, Tara. David, first question for you: What drew you to the interview transcript format that Seven Down is written in, and what does this format add to the story as opposed to writing it in a more traditional format? Well, the the uh, the first chapter that I wrote was in a sort of conventional uh, first person narrative, uh, but uh, uh, subsequent chapters as I went along, uh, I think I were informed by my research, which was uh, I was reading the uh, the WikiLeaks cable dumps. Uh, I was uh, reading uh, uh, interviews with murderers. And uh, it just, uh, it struck me as a really fun thing to, uh, uh, um, uh, a way not to repeat myself. Uh, uh, so uh, what, it, what it ended up introducing was um, uh, a present tense um, and another level of uh, difficulty that I really didn't want to take on. Uh, what what had happened was, uh, you know, like in a conventional narrative, you're you're generally talking about the recent past or the deep past, but in a dialogue, now you 
suddenly have a completely different timeline, which is the present tense. And something has to happen in that uh, these two people have to interact and uh, there has to be uh, an, another narrative there somehow. And so uh, I sort of damned myself to do it that way. Yeah, Lucky, luckily Russell was there. Thanks for that, David. We uh, started a little bit late because we had some technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go through the uh, second round of questions. If I could ask you to keep your answers brief uh, and cogent, that would be great. And just because I can, I'm gonna mix up the order this time around. So Sifton, let's start with you. The question is, what do you think makes a literary fantasy versus a regular fantasy? Hmm, okay, so I think and someone, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I believe that literary fiction is more kind of like a fictional story that is rooted more in reality. Um, so it kind of deals with, you know, like real life issues, real life problems. Um, but again, because it's fiction, it has, you know, that kind of tinge of, you know, not real situations. Um, yeah. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Sifton. Uh, Rowan, let's go to you next. What are your thoughts on the future of creative nonfiction? Do you have any advice for those who are currently writing in the genre? Sorry, I think you just unmute. Your, sorry, you were muted for a second. Oh, moment. okay. Am I muted now? You're good now. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think that creative nonfiction, nonfiction has a very good future ahead of it. Um, I find that as someone who enjoys reading creative nonfiction, that I'm finding more and more works of that sort that I really quite enjoy. I also find that um, there's more of a variation coming into the Fiddlehead magazine, of which I'm the creative nonfiction editor for. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, three pieces of advice that I would give or some pieces of advice I would give. Um, one is to read widely. There's a lot of excellent, excellent material out there that makes use of uh, the lyric form and, and in order to develop your skills as a writer, you have to be a reader. That's for me, number one. Um, the second thing would be that it's not necessary for you to bleed on the page like to know where your boundaries are and what your limits are in terms of what you share, that it's not possible, that it's not necessary for you to give everything. You can hold back what you feel is, is the boundary lines where you need to hold it. Um, and the third thing I would say is that um, give time to play. Like, the whole concept of experimentation to me is that it also provides opportunity to play, play with language, play with structure, play with form, because in this way you can, you can begin to develop further skills in writing creative nonfiction and, and have those skills become more integral to yourself simply by making use of play. I think that's something that because we're writing serious material at times with creative nonfiction, that to me, that's one thing that's super important is to make room for play with what you're writing. Those are all great suggestions. Thank you so much for that, Rowan. Uh, we're gonna go to David next because this is also a process question. Uh, you write from the perspective of multiple characters in your book with a complex plot woven through each narrative. How do you avoid getting tripped up by the pitfalls of that? And are there pieces of advice you can give to somebody writing a similar type of book in order to keep things straight in their minds? Yes, um, get an exceptional proofreader. Uh, luckily, I was provided with one uh, because I, I, you know, I was a mess myself. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, the actual event, the operation that I'm talking about, this is a botched assassination. It wasn't that complicated, but it was the sort of crisscrossing of all the characters that became very hard to keep track of. And uh, I, I did a little crude diagram at one point, um, uh, but mostly uh, I just, uh, 
I just prayed. I think prayer is undervalued as a, an assistant to, in the writing process. Uh, where shall we go next? Sumaya, for those who haven't read your book, could you tell us about the myth of the Shaitan Bride and how you see yourself in that narrative? Sure. This is probably one of my favorite questions, but it's probably the one that I can go on for hours talking about, and I always ramble a little bit too because I have so much to say about it. So feel free to, uh, to uh, you know, prompt, like give me a, a signal if I'm going on for too long. But um, essentially, the Shaitan Bride is an entity that I created to describe the eccentric women that I heard about while growing up. And um, they were described, like these women were described as having a reckless passion. They followed their hearts. They crossed lines. They broke rules. They spoke up. They, they, this, all of these actions somehow made them like transgress. Um, they were a social recluse or they were someone to pity, disown, gossip about or slander. And their behaviors were so incomprehensible that the understanding was that maybe there was an outside force, something sinister that was interfering with them because how could they have such audacity to, to do these things? And so essentially like the message was, you know, whatever you do, just don't be like that because that might it, like affect your life, affect, you know, as a woman, like to protect yourself, don't do that. And so, um, you know, as, as I heard these stories, I also realized like there was some similarity between that and other women that even in the, like North American context, I had read about that surfaced in psychology books that, uh, you know, like philosophy books, um, just history in general, where you see this pattern where like there's a demonization and uh, where like the woman is either blamed or scapegoated for humanity's darkest aspects. And it, it, I was always very curious about that. Like, why, why is it, why is it that? And, you know, it's like, there was something core underneath it. Was it misogyny? Was it like, where did it come from? Like, wh what, what is that? And so, um, and especially in relation to men, because, you know, as this is a coming of age story, I start to see that there's different rules and codes that seem to be applied to them in all of the different contexts that I was in. Um, and then as I get older, I start to see, you know, some of the aspects of this woman um, or these women in reflected in myself. And it brings out all sorts of different feelings for me. Um, but, uh, you know, there's shame, there's curiosity, there's like, uh, like my personal, like uh, internal drives, like a uh, sense of, you know, there's very like mixed feelings that come up about that. And um, later on, I, I get very interested to know about the story of Shaitan or Satan in Christianity. And I learn about this whole other side of Shaitan in Sufi philosophy, which describes Shaitan before he became Shaitan as, uh, you know, Iblis and Iblis basically was casted out of paradise because he didn't bow to uh, Adam when God requested that he did. And the interpretation is that he was, you know, envious. He was, um, had too much pride, but there was an alternative, alternative um, sort of interpretation of that from the Sufis where they said, well, you know, it, it's because he had so much love for God that he didn't want to bow down to anything else other than God, because that that's a form of like in Islam, you would say like, you know, sure, like if you're associating something else with God and not just God itself. And so there's a great misunderstanding and there's a great betrayal and the heart of Iblis becomes so inflamed and so angry that he decides to, you know, he's when he's casted as Shaitan, he decides that he will get, um, you know, vengeance by luring humans into their their lowest instincts, right? So I kind of put these two concepts together, like this alternative understanding of the devil and then this understanding of like these women who are casted alongside the devil and like where that comes from. And for me, like it kind of just, these two ideas just kind of came together. And I just thought, to my mind that essentially it's like there's this darkness and it's incomprehensible it's not understood um and it like getting into this darkness and uh being able to um you know ex like see all these these um 
like having an experience where I got to see like these dark mm -hmm. aspects of humanity and like within my own self um, and having to make sense of that, but still be able to come out of that with um, mm -hmm. sort of a, a restored sense of like, like being able to see clarity and truth and still have some sort of res restored sense of faith in humanity and in God. Like to me, that was um, like a pro psychological sort of process mm -hmm. that I went through mm -hmm. uh, to be able to differentiate mm -hmm. between what is essentially faith from what is like, what is culture, what is patriarchy, what is systems of control and power. And I had to psychologically separate those things out in order to still have, uh, to make it through that experience that I went through in my memoir that I talk about. And I think this is very important to, for me, like I, in retrospect, like now when I work with uh, clients um, from a social work psych psych psychotherapy perspective too, like one of the things that I often see is when, you know, you have uh, like gender-based violence and uh, spiritual abuse sort of uh, intersecting, what you see is like this dichotomy that's presented where it's like, well, either you believe and you endure this or you don't believe and you're cast it out. And then you, what are you cast it out into? And so um, I want, wanted to also break this dichotomy and say, no, actually, um, this, this dichotomy that's set up, it has nothing to do with the actual religion. It has nothing to do with Islam. It has nothing to do with actual faith because Islam is very much founded in uh, when it comes to marriage and faith. There is it's there's free will with that. And then there's also uh, like justice is a core part of it. So I had to uh, like, there's a renewed sense of faith, but the Shaitan bride was for me like a vehicle to um, process that. Um, and she was, and, and it's interesting because I think writing this memoir for me was almost like a narrative therapy exercise because in authoring my own story, what you can see is that like to some extent you have to like uh, in processing that I had to externalize all that was, I, all that was uh, the messages that I had received, right? All throughout my, you know, upbringing and also like culturally um, and messages about women and men and gender and all that. And I had to process that, I had to externalize that into this, into something outside that I could understand and be able to, uh, embrace. Um, and then through that process, I, I went through my own type of liberation. So, so, uh, it's, it's a very layered, um, and you can actually see this in, in this concept in, in so many different angles, because there, I can even go on further about all these other angles. Uh, but essentially that's the core of it. And it's actually also, uh, a, an actual woman that I meet in Bangladesh too, um, that I become fascinated with because she is one of those women. And, um, you know, there, so, and she has a similar story that she um, sort of experiences. And I'm just so curious to try to understand that. And so, yeah, so, so there's different layers to it, but, but essentially that's, that's what it is. She's a figurative, she's a, a person, but she's also a figurative device that I use. And it's, it's very much as much as it is a um, like it like a literary memoir. It's, it's also like, yeah, it's captures like a psychological um, process. And it's also very much. Um, yeah, it's like it, it's also asked these sort of questions that also that remain unanswered for me, like in terms of like I'm still processing it and we're still um, I think years later, we're still asking these questions about um, gender and these, um, these uh, bigger underlying societal forces that are at work. Thanks so much, Subaya. Uh, Sky, second question for you. Can you tell us why you were interested in imagining the life of Gloria Graham through the lens of a character who is her complete opposite? What do you think this adds to the book? So interesting that the person would say the complete opposite because it's not, he's not the complete opposite at all. I guess it comes from a notion that the genders are opposite, which I would also um, question to some degree. Um, so I don't think he is uh, her opposite. Um, I think that I was originally drawn to the Gloria Graham story. 
um, I just have always been, um, when I found out the details of her life, when you find them out, you're going to go quite crazy. But when I found the details of her life, I was just amazed because she is an amazing woman. And, um, and I always love Hollywood movies and I, 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 that, that awakens my, they awaken my imagination as a writer. I've written a lot of books and essays that have been, uh, sort of movie centered or had, had that as an inspiration. And then it became thinking about, uh, like I am, but I'm not her. <laughs> I have to come to that realization. <laughs> just, you know, just the mere writing of it makes me go, I'm not her. Um, and, um, and that for me, it's a bit of a drag novel. So it's a bit of a, a sense of, which I've never really written a drag novel. I've written a novel about women, but I've never written a novel where I went, hey, I'm coming full out about this. This is a, a man writing about being feeling about the woman inside or portraying a woman. Or so um, I don't think they are opposites. I think that that's the funny thing is they kind of begin to meld, and uh, that was also Russell helping me too was the ways in which the two might meld. But I think that they um, do, and I think that yeah, like I you know I'm I'm Gloria Graham on some level. <laughs> You know what I mean? Definitely. So there's a melding there. There's not an opposite thing as far as I'm concerned. I, uh, I thought I knew about Gloria Graham and her history until I read this book, and then I had to go back and Google it. And uh... It's all true. I mean, I mean, the basic facts are true. The facts are true. I, Absolutely. My imaginary take on it, but the most scandalous stuff in the book is true. It's it's for for anybody who doesn't know about Glory Graham and wants to know. It's a fascinating story. Uh, Tara, you uh, you get the headlining question. How does your memoir add to Indigenous literature, and how does it differ from the memoirs that are already out there? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think that um, a lot of Indigenous writers um, uh, get kind of like we get often like shafted into kind of a particular box or the kind of a, a, like one particular sort of a style of, of narratives that people are interested in hearing from indigenous writers a lot of the time um i think that this happens in general with racialized writers more broadly where like racialized writers are like need to write the they need to be like good ambassadors like you know like a lot of the time um and i really wanted to write uh, uh, I really wanted to write a behaving badly memoir <laughs> for uh, on behalf of my um, of my kinfolk um, because because uh, like I've always been it's always been frustrating for me as like it, it happens as a, as a woman writer and it happens as a racialized writer that like um, you don't get the same kind of like license to behave poorly you know and like and just like and not have it all figured out yet and like not have like have it be like a redemption story where everything turns out hugs and puppies at the end and like you learn a lesson and you teach the lesson to everybody and you hold everybody else's hand while they come along the lesson with you um and uh i just wanted it to be fun like that you know like um so it's like as much as i do think there's like some stuff about like resilience and you know like you know, like like to the, the typical stuff that I think a lot of like uh, settler audiences I think want to hear from from indigenous writers, but how like things were bad, but and now I'm stronger. Yeah, you, know, you know, like the kind of stuff that makes people feel a bit <laughs> better about genocide. Um, it's a, uh, it's I think also there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that's that's I think more representative of the kind of art that I really like and like you know like and like um, like you know some of my biggest my biggest uh, writing influences are people like Hunter Thompson and uh, Joan Didion, people who like weren't afraid to be like kind of like biting and um, and uh, and you know behave poorly and not come across super great. So like those are that's that's I think that that's what I, that's what I'd like to be for Indigenous writing. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Tara. Uh, we are running short of time, but we did start. Um, a little bit late, so we've got a speed round of questions. I'm going to ask one of them, and uh, just very quickly, I'm going to go, you know, hit you up in random order. The question is, who would star in the movie adaptation of your book, uh, Rowan? Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm unmuted now, right? No. No, you're um, good. Oh, I'm good. Okay. Um, God, I have no idea. <laughs> um, I could give you another one. What yeah, are you currently okay. reading? 
Um, all of this has nothing to do with you by Monica Sabello. It's the hybrid um, novel where she is, um, it's about a character who works in the ad agency and she falls in love with her new hire and becomes kind of obsessive about, about, about him. So you know, she has pictures of like um, the food he's eaten. He, she takes when they go for lunch, she takes his keys because just so they could be close. She um, follows him and takes pictures of his motorcycle. It's just this convoluted sort of narrative that I just love. So that's what I'm reading right now. Rowan, Julie has suggested that Maya Rudolph would be a good person to star in the film of your book. Do you agree? I agree with that. <laughs> uh, Sifton, same question for you. Who would star in the movie of Yume? Oh, good gosh. I don't know. I feel like everybody, I don't know. I don't even know if they're still like acting. Like the one, I know the one person who I would have absolutely vouched for to, uh, to play Daniel. Uh, he unfortunately passed away last year, um, but his name is um, Haruma Miura. So he would have been he would have been perfect because even in the book, everyone's like, "You look like this guy." So I yeah, I would have I would have picked him, but he's unfortunately no longer with us. But it would have been a good choice. Fair enough, David. Uh, I know you've got seven different characters in your book, so I won't ask you uh, who would star in the movie adaptation of your of your book. Uh, where is your favorite writing spot? Uh, right there, where Wallace is sitting right now. My cat, Wallace. Uh, it, it's a constant struggle. Uh, if I'm sitting there and he wants to be there, uh, uh, it is a, it's a fight. Uh, he always wins. Uh, and so then I'm sort of relegated to wherever. I just have to sit in the corner on the floor. It's pathetic. Sky, who would star in the movie of your book? Oh, it's so hard. Um, I, I was thinking about it and I was going, I want Kevin Spacey to play Denton Moulton. Um, and he has like a, a, a dark history and all that. That's great. And, um, and he's just such a wonderful actor. Uh, this, so how am I going to cast Gloria Graham? I'm going to to play a movie star. I, I, I mean, I really don't know. I mean, she's. I mean, I'm trying to think of someone who maybe someone can meant, figure out someone, a, a, a female actress who has that kind of a really dangerous quality. I mean, um, um, the one I'm thinking about is Brad Delangeline, Angelina Jolie, perhaps. Um, it's that area, maybe. But um, there's also something kind of mischievous about her. Angelina Jolie is just so blatantly beautiful whereas um <laughs> you know to make a fine point of it whereas Gloria Graham was kind of um she as I said she as I said I think in that passage she wasn't so much she was beautiful but she was basically sexy like that was what drove she drove me crazy period you know it wasn't kind of a, a pretty 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 but it was like yeah how would so you feel that drives men crazy how would you feel about I, mean, I wouldn't know that because actresses don't women don't drive me crazy in that way what were you gonna say how would you feel about Kate Winslet a Kate Winslet? Oh my God, no! <laughs> Kate, what's her name? The other one, Kate Blanchett, who can Kate Blanchett? do anything. Yeah. Like you know, if you're someone like her, like Kate Blanchett is like a, a, a she can transform herself. She's a chameleon. Fair enough. Tara, how about you? Who would play uh, Who would play you in the movie of your book? Jack Black. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Sumaya, same question. Oh my God, this is so hard. Because I also like Angelina Jolie, but I don't think it's going to work <laughs> race wise and other reasons. But um, yeah, I love her. Um, well, if you read my memoir, you'll know that my secret, secret desire was to be an actress. <laughs> so maybe. It Maybe it'll be me playing my own story. Why not? Um, but yeah, if, it, if I had to pick someone, I don't know. I would have to think a little bit more on that. But I really like uh, Yasmin El Mustri. She's the what the actress that's in uh, Quantico, not Priyanka Chopra, the uh, the other actress. Um, uh, I also like I don't know Lisa Ray. I could see like a dangerous like element in her. Like not by dangerous, I mean like that. I could see her with like, 
appearing as the Shaitan bride. Um, or, but I don't know, I probably also consider like someone from Bangladesh. So I'd have to like think a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, there are so many, yeah. So I definitely would want someone who uh, like demographically, like in terms of like identity matches a little bit more closely. Um, yeah, because I, I already think we don't have enough of that in, in our um, in the, the film industry. So yeah. Good answer. Good answers all around. Thank you very much for the readings, for the responses to the questions, for the speed round. Uh, I uh, I think these books are just amazing, and I think that uh, you know you've only uh, you've only deepened my appreciation for them this evening. I would like to thank Russell Smith. I would like to thank Julia Manel for Rare Machines. I would like to thank you for having me as the host tonight. Thank you to Christina Yeager, who has been behind the scenes doing all of the technical work. And thank you to all of the audience who has tuned in virtually from wherever you are. Uh, we really appreciate it. And once again, I would urge you to go to your local independent bookstore and pick up each and every one of these books. You will not be sorry. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a good night.